some of the work he's presenting here today contributed to No, it's been, it's been a pleasure to work with him. A real pleasure to work with him. <clears throat> Being sarcastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it has been. It's been great yeah. having him. Yeah, it's been great having that. That kind of response to the <laughs> Bad cop, good cop. Yeah. Between him and I, that is. All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending. I think I know everyone in here, so I'm going to introduce myself again. Um, so I'm going to be uh, presenting on uh, three chapters of the presentation, which will focus on using uh, genetic based methods to monitor black bears here in the American Southwest. And the first chapter I'm going to cover is, is looking at density of black bears in the state that Jimmy briefly mentioned. And for management agencies, you know, setting sustainable harvest limits is one of their main duties. And each year they spend a large portion of their budget um, estimating population parameters. You know, for ungulates, they have well-developed survey techniques that can provide these relatively robust estimates. Whereas for carnivores, these same estimates are often ineffective because of, you know, the secret of nature as well as the apparent low density set that carnivores uh, are at. Um, however, agencies have then turn to trying to use harvest data such as sex ratios and age structure to estimate and then track the trend of these different populations. But those data are often not representative, um, whether it's due to hunter selectivity, uh, sex specific vulnerability, as well as just small sample size harvest. And then furthermore, um, age ratios often provide, you know, ambiguous information. For example, in figure to the right here, uh, this graph increase shows our increasing uh, population growth due to a high juvenile survival, but it's indistinguishable from uh, age structure and ratio that shows population decline due to low adult survival. And so because of that, management agencies often or require these density estimates to have uh, to set sustainable harvest limits for the population to manage. And so the previous density estimates for the state uh, was generated in the 1990s by Costello um, or Sicily and, and folks you work with uh, found about 17 bears per hundred square kilometers of songrays. And then the game of fish department used various uh, metrics to then estimate the density of Andeas here in the center and then the Sacramento mouse, mountains down south. But with the advent of relatively recent uh, sampling and analytical techniques, uh, game and fish decided to update their, their harvest limits and thus density estimates first. And so they contacted us to assist with that endeavor. And so the objective for this chapter was to estimate density in three mountain ranges um, that uh, nested within that there's uh, five study areas. And so the way we did that, or I did that, I'll bounce back and forth here, uh, is we used non-invasive genetic sampling First off was a hair trap, it's just a strand of barbar around knee height, uh, strung around three or more trees. You put a non-consumable lure in the middle of it to attract bears in and snake hair from them. And we systematically distribute these across the landscape, um, putting one in every five kilometer uh, cell across the grid across the mountain range. And we sampled it about four to six times depending on the study area. And then we also used bear rubs, which is based off of the natural behavior. And due to that, you can find uh, rough trees along uh, trees on trails as well as power poles and whatnot. And we opportunistically distributed these as we were deploying our hair traps. And because it's a natural behavior, we didn't have to use any uh, lure to attract it. From uh, these sampling methods, we then uh, collected those hairs and uh, genotyped individuals using microsatellite loci, as well as identifying the sex of the bear. Now to estimate density, uh, I used a spatially explicit capture and capture model, and that estimates three parameters. First is this density submodel that represents the, the spatial point process for um, of these unobserved activities or home range centers. And what this represents is the intensity of this process is related to density, whereby you estimate the intensity across the landscape that's driven density. 
And we estimate where these activity centers are by having this detection model, um, whereby the probability of detecting an individual um, if their home range was located right at a detector declines as that home range moves away from the detector. And so we estimated you know, variation within these model parameters using uh, a suite of covariates. For example, on density, we look to see if the sex ratios within these populations differ from one another. And then we thought that the our ability to detect individuals as well as how that spatial gradient uh, declined might be a, uh, influenced by just time across the summer as well as the individual, individual sex. And then elevation or land cover type, which we tried to use as a proxy for the uh, distribution of, of bear fruits across the landscape. Um, and then, you know, combinations of the covariates represented different hypotheses different models, and so we evaluate the support for each model using an information theoretic approach um, uh, called AICC. And so from those, uh, we sampled nearly 15,000 square kilometers across uh, New Mexico. We had about 550 hair traps, 120 bear rubs, and we collected 4,000 hair samples with the majority of those coming from hair traps. And that allowed us to identify 726 individuals with about a roughly one to one uh, male to female ratio. Uh, across the study areas, it looks like our, our top models suggested that uh, we had equal sex ratios within each mountain range, except for here in the northern Sacramento Mountains. And then we kind of had a, a similar pattern for these detection covariates, whereas time as well as um, cover or elevation were important explanatory variables, except here in the Sandias, which showed that sex of the bear best explained uh, variation in those parameters. From those models, density wise, um, our, our lowest density estimates were in the southern Sacramento, so at 16 and a half bears per 100 square kilometers, with the highest being in the Sandias. Uh, and, you know, from that, we looked. Uh, Kind of stuff we can glean from this analysis is that you know time, elevation, and land cover type were important explanatory variables over most of the, of the mountain ranges, and, and most likely this is related to both the uh, reproductive history as well as the foraging behavior of the species. For example, uh, reproduction or, or mating occurs from denim emergence uh, peaks around June, and at that time, males are traversing their home range, um, seeking out these receptive females, increasing their movement rate. Um, by midsummer, you have your masting season is beginning, so you have your berries coming on. By uh, late summer, early fall, you have a uh, peak in that masting season, but now we've switched over to uh, acorns and juniper berries. And at this time, bears are hitting up this really patchily distributed food landscape as they're trying to double the floor um, intake per day. So in, that, in order to uh, accumulate those fat stores, both hibernation and then reproduction in females. Just to put the context of our study, um, or put our study in the context of black bears across North America, our density estimates fall kind of mid mid range. You know, your highest density estimates are on the east coast here in that frozen habitat of North Carolina, Virginia, that real high product, uh, productive areas. And then we've uh, our density estimates are, are actually about similar to those here in Colorado, just north of us, and then much higher than a few other areas. Um, but those populations are kind of represented by expanding, recolonizing populations, as well as those here in Glacier that are uh, St. Patrick with grizzly bears. And so, you know, the management implications of this is first off, it's important um, that we just add another point to the modern of the species across the range. That provides insight into that variation. And then um, lastly, it also provided updated density estimates for game fish, which assisted them in setting harvest limits for the species for that sustainable harvest. And they implemented those harvest limits um, in August of 2015. Okay, one down. Um, that was pretty great. <laughs> they only get longer. <laughs> Uh, so the, the second chapter um, used the same data, but it kind of turned it and evaluated it in a different way. And it's 
And in this chapter, I focused on you know validating the performance of occupancy models for habitat use and species distribution of these highly known species, and that'll be important in a second. And so, you know, since, since their inception, occupancy models have been um, uh, crucial for, you know, estimating habitat covariates that predict the occupancy of a, of a species as well as predicting their distribution across the landscape. And it does so in a, in a simple model where you try to estimate the probability of occupancy while accounting for imperfect detection. And what I mean by imperfect detection is, um, imagine we go out and survey uh, three ponds here, a boreal forest rock. And if we had perfect knowledge of the landscape, then we would know that two out of the three ponds are occupied and we can measure these habitat covariates and then predict where frogs would be across the landscape. However, that's usually not the case. We usually don't always perfectly detect them. And so all we can really say is, well, we know this one's occupied because we detected it. But is this one not occupied because, or because we, it's just not occupied or because we didn't detect it at all? And so that imperfect detection, P, is accounted for in that model parameter. Now, the issue we run into, though, is when it comes to highly mobile species. For example, if we're doing a camera trap study on tigers, what, what do we call occupancy when you have an individual that's able to traverse across multiple sampling units on the landscape? Um, and so this is a common problem where they violate this assumption that sampling units are close to changes in occupancy. And what has commonly been done is, is we get this reinterpretation, whereas, well, as long as they're randomly moving in and out of these sampling units, then instead of occupancy, we'll just call it use. And so that's an intriguing idea, but um, it's rarely, that assumption is rarely evaluated, whether how well the model actually fits the data itself. And then it's uh, very validated in terms of predicting across the landscape and trying to use capability. And so the objectives for this uh, chapter is, was first to use occupancy modeling to estimate habitat use for a, for a highly mobile species. And then we want to evaluate the fit of the most supported model. You know, is it fitting the assumptions of the model well, like we expect it to? And then after we get that top model, well, how well does it actually predict use across the landscape? So that's what we'd like to validate. And to do so, I. Um, Used a case study um, using two independent data sets that were collected at two different scales. Not surprisingly, that was on American black bear. And kind of contrary to your typical presentation, I'm not going to go met, uh, methods, results, discussion. Instead, I'm going to walk you through um, how we tested hypotheses related to habitat use, and then taking that model, how we predicted across the landscape, and then finally how we actually validate that model. And so to test it, we, uh, we hypothesized that habitat was influenced by first the uh, variation in productivity across the landscape, um, because you know food availability is highly correlated with multiple food production and survival, and predicted that as use will increase as that productivity value increases as well. We also thought or hypothesized that terrain complexity could be an important driver because you know, has different hydrological profiles and that can influence stuff like security cover, forest diversity, as well as productivity. And again, it's hypothesized that use would increase as, we, as uh, terrain road density is, or complexity. And then last, um, hypothesized that road density would explain use because of uh, increased disturbance, potential risk, and reduced survival. And predicted there that use will decrease as, as road density. So the data for this whole uh, modeling effort was uh, first off, I uh, had four study areas, three of them nested in within New Mexico. And the first, the state, that's where we collected a, a, one of these validation data sets. We used uh, mortality locations from uh, hunter harvest, rope fields and depredations. Um, then collected another validation set in the, in the Hamas Mountains where we had GPS collared black bears across, across the mountain range. And then last, the data that I collected for the habitat use was in the Sangre de Cristos and Sacramento's, and that's the, that the um, data I collected in the first, first chapter, those hair samples. But the key difference, though, is, is in occupancy modeling, instead of needing the individual ID of the hair sample, now we just need to know whether or not the hair sample came from a black bear. So we're looking at presence absence data. So occupancy modeling, um, specifically I used a single season, single species model. 
And just to refresh you, we're going to have to estimate two parameters. One is our, our ability to detect the species and then probability that that site is used. Um, I modeled um, imperfect detection as well as representing these hypotheses on habitat using you know, a suite of biotic and abiotic covariates. And I measured each covariate for each cell, which is our sampling unit across um, each study area. For detection, I thought that it could potentially vary due to what your or lure we actually applied to the um, lure pile, as well as uh, the mountain range that the trap was set in because of just inherent differences in, in populations, as well as we had different survey lengths in the songbird crystals versus the certain metals. And then lastly, I also uh, used distance to road as a covariate because hypothesized that if a trap was closer to a road, it'd be less likely that a bear would visit that trap. And that's effect I really was tempting. For uh, use, I represented those uh, hypotheses that I mentioned uh, using terrain ruggedness, uh, road density, and then the dominant land cover type within each cell. Furthermore, I wanted to represent that photosynthetic productivity on the landscape, so I used the enhanced vegetation index, which is a remotely sensed variable. Um, but you know, more in besides just the spatial distribution of productivity, I was also interested in the temporal variation that might occur. And so, to account for that, I also uh, calculated the coefficient of variation as a uh, parameter for variable. And then, lastly, I also just included a, a mountain range effect just to again look at natural variation between mountain ranges to see if they use the landscape. So to uh, conduct a multi-step modeling process. And first, what I did is ask, OK, well, what best explains detection probability? And so to do this, I, I used a global model for, for use, which is just adding all the parameters and soaking up a bunch of variation, and then varying detection by the different covariates. After that, I said, all right, well, what best explains use now that we know what this best detection model is? So I included the best model here and then varied psi by the different uh, combinations of model variants. <clears throat> and then I evaluated the support um, for you know, the best detection as well as the best use model, again, using AIC. And then I looked at the actual model fit and whether or not we violated any model assumptions using these uh, John Smith residuals, which is a visual diagnostic plot. And those are pretty easy to interpret here. So we found some interesting results. Uh, Parameter-wise, it looks like uh, blood had the highest detection probability on the landscape, um, with some uh, suggestion that we may have had differences of detection between mountain ranges, probably likely because of that uh, difference in survey length. In terms of use, as both uh, the EDI, so that productivity, as well as the variation increased on the landscape, so did the probability that uh, a bear would use that cell. And then as uh, road density increased in value, the probability that an animal would use that cell decreased. So, Dunn-Smith uh, residuals, these are uh, easy. All we're trying to look is to see if it's 95% band here, whether or not that overlaps here. And if it does, then we can assume that we didn't have any model assumptions violated in our, in our model well. And in all 10 simulations, it does overlap zero, suggesting no model assumptions violated. However, we do know that's the case uh, from our density chapter, where we detected multiple individuals and multiple cells. And so what we instead believe is that um, this may instead be interpreted as we do see random movement across the landscape, and therefore we can reinterpret that side parameter to use instead of our. So now what we're going to do is take that top model and predict it into our two uh, validation study areas. Um, so for habitat use, we measured again those covariates within each cell that relate to the top model. We then plug those into our estimated regression equation, and then that's going to spit out um, probability of use values where lower values, the brown values represent low use, and green represent high use areas. And so that's a realization of that of that process right here with the Jemez Mountains and then New Mexico. And so these maps now are what we actually want to validate to see if they perform well versus where bears are using the landscape or on the landscape. So to validate, um, 
overlaid uh, these maps with uh, GPS colored locations as well as the locality locations. Um, we selected these mountain ranges or the Jemez because it was in the kind of mountain range of similar conditions. So we kind of want to evaluate how it worked in a, a similar environment, but just independent of data. Versus New Mexico was comprised of both what we call primary and non-primary bear habitat. Um, and you know, represents really conditions outside of what the model is based on. And so we wanted to kind of evaluate how it did in terms of that aspect as well. And we looked at or uh, looked at the correlation between predicted and observed use trees in that experimental correlation test. And we assumed that we would have a positive um, correlation between predicted and observed. So for the Jemez, um, across all three years, we had um, a correlation coefficients greater than 0.6, so suggesting we did pretty well. And then when we look at New Mexico overall, these white dots, which are all mortality locations, seem to really fall into what we believe are high probability areas. And that, that correlation coefficient confirms with all values greater than 0.6 as well. Um, now, just to get into what this all means, um, so what influences habitat use? Uh, based off of our modeling effort, it appears that you know food resources are very influential. Not surprising, given that uh, oak mass particularly particularly is correlated with reproductive females. We also found that uh, row density was influential, and this has been you know found in numerous uh, bear studies across the range. And then finally, we didn't find any support for terrain complexity or mountain range. And this may be because um, you know, we limited our available sampling units to mountain ranges themselves. So we kind of already accounted for that. And then mountain range may not have been uh, important because the song grazing in Sacramento are, are similar in their orography, land cover, and climate. So within this chapter, um, we showed that uh, predicted and observed habitat use were correlated, uh, both within an independent mountain range as well as in an area that's outside the conditions that constructed that model. And um, this supports the ability or shows the efficacy of using occupancy models to uh, estimate habitat use and, and predict the distribution of highly mobile species, um, even when they're you know, violating that geographic closure assumption. And then, you know, uh, validating this procedure has some important conservation implications as well. Uh, you know, occupancy modeling is a, is a common conservation and management tool for a lot of agencies, particularly when they're charged with sampling, you know, rare species as well as those that are difficult to capture or the traditional methods that they've always used that are Okay. So, we're going to expand the scope of the research a little bit. The last two chapters were focused on New Mexico, and now we're going to look at the Southwest overall. And in doing so, we're going to look at landscape genetics of American black bear in the Southwest. And so I want to give just a little brief history on the phylogeography of, of bears in the Southwest. Um, Pleistocene characterized, you know, this uh, climatic fluctuation, driving, you know, huge changes in glacial and interglacial cycles. And that caused, you know, Suite of flora and fauna to be isolated, you know, severely impacting their geographic as well as his, um, a demographic uh, processes. And the bears are no different. Um, they were isolated to uh, northern and, and southern continental uh, refugia. And as the uh, ice sheets re regress forth, bears followed uh, the forest outside of those refugia into their current distribution. Now, in their Northern range bears occupy a really large contiguous habitat. Um, they're large populations and they just, they show this isolation by distance um, uh, genetic relationship, whereby as the geographic distance increases between individuals, so too does the genetic distance. Bears in the Western and Northeast part of the state were heavily exploited um, by European expansion um, as well as habitat loss. They have since recovered and have recovered in previous areas and are expanding into old areas. They show maybe a slightly less genetic diversity than their northern most counterparts, but are overall stable, healthy populations. 
In contrast, we have populations here down in the southeast portion of North America, which, uh, you know, perhaps suffered even more habitat loss and persecution than those in other areas. And these populations are now represented, are now, you know, extremely small, isolated, and show some of the lowest levels of diversity across that entire range. In the southwest, we have a unique uh, but kind of an unclear uh, dynamic going on. Um, bears are occupied what we call sky island mountain ranges here in the gray, where they're high elevation separated by low, uh, low elevation uh, desert and grassland valleys. We know that bears in uh, north northern Mexico recolonized uh, Big Bend in West Texas. But in terms of Arizona and New Mexico, we have a little bit more of a clear dynamic. Uh, we've had studies that have shown that both Arizona and New Mexico have uh, structured populations as well as large just admixed populations. Um, you combine that with the fact that we uh, these populations are threatened by um, uh, climate change, particularly forest fires and, and anthropogenic land use like uh, our urbanization here shown in Tucson. Um, you know, trying to get a clear picture of the genetic diversity as well as relationships across this entire region is, is would be warranted. And so the objectives of this last chapter were to uh, describe the genetic structure of black bears, then wanted to identify the landscape features that are promoting uh, gene flow across landscape, and then from there, determine, well, what's the relative degree and direction of that genetic connectivity? Are, are populations exchanging individuals equally, or is one population dominating that, that migration dynamic? So I generated four hypotheses, four hypotheses related to both genetic structure as well as gene flow. And the first one was that the uh, historic barriers were formed by post-glacial habitat uh, fragmentation, which isolated bears. That's that Pleistocene dynamic coming along. And I term that the, the historical landscape hypothesis. Contrary to that, there's this contemporary thinking that bears have actually been isolated by interstates, and that's what's caused the isolation. Um, gene flow among subpopulations, I hypothesize that you know, it could be filtered by the mosaic of black bear habitat distributed through the southwest, versus what's kind of a null hypothesis. Um, but given the isolation of bears on different mountain ranges, I also hypothesize that uh, genetic and ge geographic distance increase in concert, and that's what I term the, the distance hypothesis. So to do all of this, um, I sampled 550 individual black bears from across uh, the Southwest. Um, these individuals were genotyped at 15 loci, giving us a better look into the genetic structure populations. And for genetic structure, you know, if, if the historical landscape hypothesis is to be supported, then I'd predict that the subpopulation boundaries would correlate with ecoregions or potentially, as, as an example here, different ecoregions or um, the mountain ranges across the landscape. Conversely, the contemporary barrier hypothesis supported that I'd predict that the boundaries would correlate with the distribution of these major rovers, particularly um, interstates, which is thought to be the primary driver of isolation. Um, to determine the genetic structure across the landscape, I use program GeneLand, which is a spatial uh, clustering method that's been uh, shown to be highly effective at, at identifying uh, barriers compared to the similar clustering method. And I use both what's called an uncorrelated and cordial frequency model. And all this, all this is doing is just saying whether or not populations or individuals are close to each other, whether we assume their uh, allele frequency should, frequency should be independent of each other, or those closer to, to each other are more likely to share a similar genetic index. And then once we identified or identified the different subpopulations, if any, I calculated um, your typical genetic diversity and, and differentiation, such as uh, expected observed heterogosity, allele richness, primal alleles. Uh, FIS, which is the inbreeding coefficient, and then F FST is your uh, typical genetic differentiation, so how different are populations. Um, so when it comes to determining the landscape features that, that dictate gene flow, I want to clarify a point first. So the distance hypothesis kind of serves to that our null hypothesis. 
And if we imagine the landscape as, as a grid, what happens is that bears that are geographically um, more closely, geographically closer, are likely to be more genetically related than say two in the corners where you have to travel a farther distance. Um, conversely, a filter hypothesis, what this is, is, is attempting to show is, well, we know that there's other forces that restrict movement on the landscape. There's resistance traveling. And so these values represent how, uh, how much resistance or how difficult it is an individual to move through each pixel. So for a landscape resistance, these two individuals may be less genetically uh, related than those two in the corner because there's more resistance for this individual to travel between each other than it is to follow this low resistance path up to the corner. And so after we calculate um, or determine, you know, what landscape covariates represent these resistance surfaces, what we then do is we take, um, we calculate what's called the Euclidean distance as well as the effective landscape distance. So that's those values or those distances between two individuals, and then predict as or see if it explains what the genetic distance is as well. And so once we've generated um, genetic, you know, landscape distances using the various covariates, we then evaluate whether or not those resistance surfaces, which one best explains genetic distance by using the axes again. But this time we're also going to do some uh, bootstrap integrations to evaluate, well, how robust are these findings if we take certain individuals out of the model? Are there some individuals that are drastically different from each other? And that's going to be driving some of the um, relationships we see. And then once we figure out, well, what's the, what model gains the highest percentage of those iterations, I then decided to look at, all right, well, how does this resistance surface actually compare to, we just look at uh, a geographic distance. So I compared it to a model that included just distance, as well as the two, um, one that included both distance and uh, landscape distance. So for the covariates that I thought would potentially affect movement across the landscape, um, I selected precipitation um, as a covariate to represent a hypothesis that you know food resources um, are going to explain that that movement because again they need to accumulate fat stores while they're dispersing. Uh, furthermore, maybe forest canopy height would be important because bears are forest obligates and have evolved different adaptations associated with forest stands. And then also potentially water bodies because you know in the arid southwest, thermal refugia is important as morphologically of those thick hides as well as high temperatures um, could increase the susceptibility of black bears to hypothermia. Um, also, I thought that well, potentially linear water features um, can be important because they contain you know, food, escape, and thermal cover, as well as acting as travel corridors for bears across the landscape. Um, terrain ruggedness, as, as black bears have been shown to use, or males in particular have been shown to use less rugged areas, and, and black bears exhibit female bias phylopatry, meaning bear, males are the ones dispersed across the landscape. And then also thought that maybe road density as well as road barriers would be important because of you know, the, the myriad of research that's shown both negative behavioral genetic effects as well as uh, increased mortality rate. And then lastly, again, we want to look at the degree and uh, genetic connectivity among these subpopulations. And I did this by estimating uh, the relative migration, uh, the, degree, uh, the relative migration rate among the subpopulations and did this using program uh, if migrate. And what's nice about this is we can actually evaluate whether we have asymmetric migration going along um, by using uh, bootstrapping again. And if the confidence intervals of that bootstrapping iteration you know, overlap, then we assume that uh, asymmetric gene flow is occurring in one direction or the other. And the nice thing about using this uh, graph network of relative migration is that the wavelength and shading is determined by the relative strength of migration, which also kind of serves as another method to evaluate, you know, whether or not individual or populations that exchange higher rates of migration are more likely to cluster together than those that don't. So it gives us kind of another check. So 
Uh, gene line using the uncorrelated little frequency model uh, identified six what I termed regional subpopulations. Uh, we kind of have Boulder Mountain in Texas. Um, this is Southern Utah uh, out by themselves. Um, we have these three large populations called uh, what I call the Eastern Colorado Plateau in, in Southern Rockies, the Datamogion, as well as the Mexican Highlands. And then down here to the south, we have the Sky Islands that are south of Interstate 10. Now, when we use that correlated little frequency model, which should give us a little bit more nuance on the landscape, those regional populations are then broken down by uh, mountain ranges. And these values here are, are representing the uh, relative migration rates that are occurring um, between the subpopulations. And we'll get, we'll get a little bit more into that here later. Um, in terms of just your basic summary statistics, just to kind of give you a quick overview, uh, what's most interesting is, is the Texas region had uh, nearly 21 private alleles, whereas the next highest were very low, uh, depending on which model was assumed, which is a lot of private alleles, which is surprising. And what's also surprising is that down the Huachuca, Santa Rita's, and the Chiricahuas, those are those mountain ranges south of Interstate 10 in Arizona. Those show uh, the lowest diversity metric for fossil legal richness and um, observed heterozygosity compared to values that are in the you know, 50s and 60s and are similar to other black bear ranges across the US. Uh, differentiation wise, uh, the Boulder Mountain um, here in Southern Utah as well as Texas show either high or very high differentiation with all um, populations across the landscape, whereas we see uh, low differentiation between those, those uh, three large populations in the center of the region. By mountain range, we see that same, uh, same pattern. Again, Boulder Mountain and Texas are, are high or very highly differentiated. And then across, um, across the southwest, what the pattern is happening here is kind of um, Mountain ranges that are more closely together are less genetically different or more genetically similar, which makes some sense. And then this is just showing these, these uh, populations here down in the Southern Sky Islands as well, where we see very high to high differentiation um, of them. So the landscape features that are actually affecting gene flow or top models show that canopy height precipitation its rate ruggedness was. Uh, best supported. And this was ranked the top model in 82% of those thousand instant bootstrap generations. Um, when I compared that model to just distance alone, so this is that landscape resistance versus uh, land, or landscape resistance versus genetic dis or geographic distance, uh, landscape resistance was heavily supported as being uh, more important or better explain the genetic difference, differences across the landscape. However, when you combine that, that uh, composite surface with distance alone, it shows that that was, highly, um, that was highly supported, showing that distance, although it's not as, as big of a deal for genetic distance, is still important in the overall scheme. So looking at the uh, degree um, and direction of connectivity, uh, we kind of see similar results as to what we saw in our FST. These are those three large uh, regional populations that we observed, they seem to be clustered together, exchanging some but low levels of, of, of gene flow with the Sky Island South End. But Texas and Boulder seem to be just kind of out on their own. Overall, we have low levels of, of gene flow occurring, as there's only two connections that show a relative value of greater than 0.5, um, and one being the, the highest level of gene flow we see on the landscape. And then we have, when we look at asymmetric migration, we did see some significant relationships um, occurring. And I won't go into this too much because it's hard to tell, but I'll, I'll get into what that actually means here. Mountain range wise, we see the same pattern, but again, just broken down, the re big regions broken down by mountain range. We see those uh, clusters kind of in the center of the region all together. Here's those Scott Islands, uh, Huachuca, Santa Rita, and Chiricahuas. And then you have Texas and Boulder Mountain, Utah, off on their own. Again, some uh, low levels of gene flow occurring, except for those in that center portion of the region. And then we did observe um, 
significant asymmetrical migration of hopper mass. So, what does this all mean? Well, that's a good question. Um, our, our findings support the historical landscape hypothesis. Originally, the subpopulation sub boundaries appeared to roughly follow the distribution of equal regions um, on the landscape. Um, we believe that these three, or I believe that these three regional populations here form what I believe is the core of Southwest Black Bear populations with Boulder Mountain and Texas exhibiting little to no conductivity. Uh, we also, also support it because they, they follow the distribution of mountain ranges. Conversely, didn't find support for the contemporary barrier hypothesis because these boundaries we would have predicted follow the distribution of interstates. Instead, what we found is that we had individuals on either sides of the interstates, um, both here in Arizona and New Mexico, being clustered together in the same, the same range. Um, for the filter hypothesis, we found support as that the best explanation for gene flow across the landscape. Uh, canopy height was important, which isn't surprising given their forest adapted species. This has been an important driver for genetic structure and, and habitat use across the range. And then like many ecological processes in the Southwest, precipitation is important. And it's likely because it's driving, uh, as, as we're all aware of this transient mosaic of habitat across the landscape following uh, monsoonal rains. And a great example of the influence of precipitation in the Southwest is um, in the Chiso Mountains of Big Bend, one year they had a drastic drought causing uh, catastrophic food failures across that entire mountain range. And the bears from the Chisos actually ended up all migrating back to, or almost all of them migrated back to the Sierra del Carmen's of Mexico. And then lastly, terrain recognition was important, um, which I believe is reflecting that selection by dispersing males as they've been shown to uh, prefer maybe uh, less rugged valleys where there might be more uh, food for them to access particularly because you know, this species shows females biased, biased um, vital catchers so the males are gonna be the ones predominantly um, promoting gene flow across the land. And then we did find um, some support for the distance hypothesis. It was, may not have been as, as well supported as the filter, but there was some support that it's still an important component. Likely, you know, as we saw um, mountain ranges that were more closely uh, together or, or closer together were more closely related as well. So regionally our, our findings support that of what um, Atwood at all found in Arizona where they where uh, bears along the US Mexico border are uh, more genetically different um, or, or genetically distinct from the large population across uh, central Arizona. However, um, our results, along with that, was, um, are in contrast with us of Mara Snelson, where she found that um, populations of Arizona form one large contiguous population, or genetically contiguous population, with the exception of the Metatsil Mountains just east of Phoenix. In New Mexico, our, our results are also in contrast to those of Winslow, uh, where he found that there were three uh, genetic populations within the state, but couldn't determine any spatial structure to them. And he um, suggested that this lack of spatial structure was due to both bear as well as human mediated um, movement across the landscape, particularly uh, problem bears that game and fish is, is picking up in cities and moving to the mountain edge. Um, so we documented the highly variable uh, relative migration among Southwest. Uh, bears, uh, like I mentioned earlier, migration seems to be um, almost non-existence between Texas, Boulder Mountain, with the rest of the Southwest, um, with the majority of, uh, occurring within these three regional populations. Um, although there's also appears to be limited to little genetic uh, or gene flow occurring between the sky and the south of Ten and the rest of those north of the interstate. Now. Uh, what's most surprising about the um, genetic connectivity relationships we identified, and this is related to the asymmetrical, was that all the significant asymmetric uh, values or gene flow we, we relative migration that uh, we found all occurred in a northward direction. 
So all these populations of Delta in the south are showing to contribute more migrants to the populations north of them and the northern ones are to the south. And we believe that this might be a historical signature. Um, and it might act and is actually in support of what's been termed the Southwest Refugium hypothesis, where during the Pleistocene, there was actually a fourth refugium um, located in the Sierra Madre Occidental Palace of Mexico, and that we might be seeing a historical signature of expansion out of that refugium. So, since then, we have you now what's the conservation implications of, of all this? genetic structure and gene flow relationships we've identified. So the American black bear in, in the Southwest occupies a highly uh, fragmented landscape, although natural landscape, but they occur at low densities and they're threatened by various uh, uh, factors like uh, climate change, which is going to increase habitat loss as well as fragmentation. And then also we have anthropogenic land uses such as urbanization that could potentially isolate these populations further. Uh, furthermore, the U.S.-Mexico border wall for, um, acts as uh, another negative influence, particularly for those uh, bears that occur in the southern, what's called the Madrena Archipelago in the Sky Islands, south of Arizona, which are characterized by having very small, high elevation mountain ranges that are separated by vast uh, Sonoran and Chihuahuan uh, desert landscapes. And, if, you know, as habitat loss continues, we predict that these small isolated populations are the ones most at risk. And to uh, continue or to survive, these, these populations will need to migrate and shift their range northward. However, uh, the Mexico border wall has been recently proposed by uh, the administration to be expanded, particularly um, at its, uh, the, I guess, most drastic proposal was to implement what's called pedestrian fencing along its entirety. If so, that would include uh, the ability of these populations south of the border to migrate north into larger habitat tracts. Uh, furthermore, it also threatens the, the populations here just north of the border. We have the Huachuca Santa, uh, Santa Rita complex right here in the Chiricahuas, which appear to be showing little to no uh, gene flow with uh, bears that are, are north of Interstate 10. And now, uh, we could hypothesize that 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 uh, you know well it could let me back up a little bit it could eliminate uh, or or isolate these populations further which is is worrisome considering that you know both of these mountain ranges show the lowest genetic diversity and in high differentiation of these populations across the range and now one hypothesis as to why these two mountain ranges are so I guess show the lower levels of diversity as well as isolation, maybe because we have uh, Interstate 10 here, which includes their ability to migrate. However, from the analysis, it seems to show that interstates aren't acting as hard barriers for, for black migration. Instead, they're maybe acting as filters. And so that, and furthermore, uh, when we look at the uncorrelated allele model as well as, as relative migration, the Sky Islands south to 10 are consistently grouped together despite nearly 100 kilometers of both Sonoran Desert as well as a large anthropogenic footprint versus um, you know 10 to 20 kilometers that set these separate these mountain ranges from those to the north of them. And an alternative hypothesis in this entire thing is what's what's called the Madrain line hypothesis. And, and this postulates that there's an existence of a major biogeographic line that occurs that separates the southern Madrain herptofauna from um, the northern rocky herptofauna. This was um, shown to support where they found drastically different species, uh, interspecies assemblages in mountain ranges such as the Santa Rita's and the Little Rincones. And the uh, boundary for this line coincidentally falls along uh, the same route that Interstate 10 takes. And while Obviously, uh, you know, the scope of my study is doesn't have the capability to, to answer this. One point I would like to uh, make, though, is that this Madrain line, the boundary for it, uh, falls 
approximately around the boundary that occurs between what's termed the uh, New Mexican subspecies of American black bear and the West Mexican subspecies of black bear. And you know, in order to properly investigate this, you know, we'll need to sample um, or collect samples from bears in the Sierra Madre Occidentals, and that would really provide a great opportunity for transboundary uh, partnerships, collaborations between U.S. and Mexican scientists to not only determine do we have a major biogeographic line that's that's separating flora and fauna of the Southwest, but also what's the uh, current impacts of the border wall and what are the potential future impacts if, if the border wall is expanded. And so with that, I'd like to thank um, a lot of people, uh, agencies, departments that provided uh, funding, samples, in-kind support, um, all the technicians and volunteers and friends that uh, helped along the way, as well as, well as the private landowners who allowed me to access their property to sample. And then lastly, a big special thanks to my committee, uh, these two. I'm glad I got that picture. <laughs> <laughs> but Jimmy, Gary, thanks for uh, you know taking the chance on me and allow me to, to become the scientist or help me become the scientist that day. Also want to thank uh, Bill Gould, who uh, for some reason thought it was appropriate to send me pictures of him fishing in Montana routinely every summer. I wasn't jealous at all. And then lastly to my community mentor, uh, Dr. Tim Wright, who's been uh, fantastic in some of the insights he's provided on the, the different chapters that uh, we conducted. Also, uh, these three are, have been a huge influence in, in since I've been here, Andy, Nina, and my girlfriend, Jasmine. Um, and you know, had a lot of fun times up and downs with these three. And then lastly, uh, my family, who's always been there for me through the entire process, and I couldn't have done without you. And with that, I'd be glad to take any questions. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Wait, right there. That's all we gotta go. <laughs> my dad's tall, but I am taller than both my grandpas and shorter than both my grandmas. <laughs> There's a weird dynamic. Seems like you've made a lot of friends over time. Has it been a long time? <laughs> I know a few people. But yeah, I was the same. <laughs> As long. I found um, fairly strong support for the filter hypothesis, mm -hmm. but some weak support for the distance hypothesis. Seems to me those two would be interrelated. They Is there some sort of technique in use where you look at the interaction between distance and yeah, so um, what I could do is I, if I wanted to completely ignore the distance effect and only just do geographic distance, I could just include distance as uh, the covariate and that model for all of them to try and soak up all that variability and then evaluate the landscape resistance. But um, yeah, distance is completely intertwined, or ge geographic distance is completely inter intertwined with uh, genetic distance. And that's actually been a huge issue with correlations. Uh, between the pairwise data that's used to estimate these relationships um, during those analyses. Uh, it's just it's just a relative migration rate. It's related to, so the way it's calculated is you take two individuals or two populations and you come up with a hypothetical mi migrant pool. You take allele frequencies from both, kind of average them together. And then you calculate uh, differentiation between the observed and the hypothesized population. And then you plug that into effective migration. And then you use effective migration to where you normalize the largest value. Um, where you normalize by your largest values, and then that generates relative migration 
the reason why it's relative versus absolute is because um, the effective migration rate assumes that you have symmetrical um, migration, which obviously does not always occur, and it's what we really actually want to investigate here. And then also because it assumes that you have equal uh, population sizes as well. Correct. So the highest the highest migration rates was occurring from the, the Gila area north to the San Juan Sarre Cristos region. And so relative to that, we a point five would say we have half as much of migration occurring in this other two mountain ranges. So the values are the relative or standardized right. with respect to the high. Right. The highest number is one. Yeah. Um, it's that is a little bit difficult, especially with the markers we're using. Um, and so, you know, evaluating mitochondrial DNA as well would, would be certainly helpful. Uh, but the div, div migrate actually, in some of the simulations they did, they looked at you know, all processes that they um, landlocked salmon and see if they could find that historical signature um, between the, the landlocked salmon as, as well as those out in the ocean. So at least perform was capable. Yes, sir. Um, I was just Uh, that's what the Dunn-Smith residual visual diagnostic plots were supposed to be. They didn't necessarily um, simulate the model itself, but simulated the residuals between that fitted and predicted value. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so maybe I'm just not quite understanding, but the, so the Dunn Smith residual plots, that simulation was supposed to evaluate the performance of the different parameters. And so you can look at how does detection probability, is it violating the assumptions we have issues with that parameter, maybe we have the wrong parameter structure in place, versus psi, we can actually look at and evaluate that performance of that parameter as well. And actually, which what Wharton says in their paper, you can actually drill down and find out what's the issue with the model versus some of the other statistics like uh, Bailey and, and uh, McKenzie's uh, chi square statistic or the Bayesian p value. You don't necessarily have that capability, you just know that the model didn't fit your data well. And that model wasn't necessarily, some of those statistics weren't very sensitive to distinguishing uh, violation of model assumptions. Um, so drop that out because um, well, we deployed a lot of sites that were actually away from water, plus we the, the sampling unit was kind of the, it was actually the trap itself. And so I could have included a, a covariate for distance to water, and that might have been important for, um, you know, detection certainly. You know, at the time, it didn't seem as important because a lot of places were, were dry, and so a lot of the areas, I think, would have been overwhelmed um, with having so little water on the landscape, particularly some of the years like 2013, we had a severe drought. And the only uh, actual water that was on the landscape was just the two major streams that were working in the study area. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, so a few things. Um, I guess if we had perfect knowledge and, and we knew that it was actually a interstate thing that was going on, and if we just reduced that pressure a little bit, we could implement uh, you know, travel corridors, fencing structures to get them through, under, or over uh, the interstates. And that may be a good long-term solution. Uh, potential short-term solution is you could have a human mediated gene flow where you know bears from some of these higher diverse areas are then translocated within these smaller areas to uh, artificially uh, promote that gene flow. Yeah, you just might you just might confuse it with the ones that are dropping black panthers or something that night. <laughs> yeah, so I um I did look at this uh linear regression technique that was proposed by uh who was it uh folks out of uh, West Inc. that looked at it where the slope of the the relationship was a measure of, of model or correlation as well. Um, and that seemed to perform well, but we had some issues as to whether or not the data was was linear and met the assumption of linearity. So drop that. Um, use the correlation or the experiments running correlation test because that's been uh, a very common metric um, that's been shown to, to perform well in some of the other uh, resource selection validation data sets or studies. Um, so I didn't um, actually recommend anything. So I was just a, just a technical advisor. Um, but some of the harvest limits did increase um, so they were managing, so what the Game Fish did is, is the this Costello study was actually conducted in the Sangres and then the Mogollon along the Arizona New Mexico border. And in the more northern, uh, more um, mesic sites or wetter sites, they uh, extrapolated density across these areas and assumed it was similar to so 17 bears. In the southern ranges, they used the uh, nine bears Per 100 square kilometers, and then in the middle mountain ranges, they averaged on about 13. And so, some of our density estimates were higher than the uh, current density estimate they were using, and then others were actually the same that they were using. Um, like that southern Sangre de Cristos mountain range was the same, and so they left that harvest limit as as it is to keep a stable population versus some others they um, they had extra bears that could be harvested, so they they bumped the limit. Follow up on that. Um, are their population static? No. So historically, they've been harvest limits for a long time. I think several years. Now they have another point. Is there, yeah. Is there any decision by Game Fish to try and modify harvest rates at a shorter time scale? Um, I don't. I don't know that answer. Um. I know they don't just use the point estimate, they actually include that estimate in the population dynamic or demographic model where they include uh, density um, or abundance depending on the primary habitat to estimate the abundance of the population. And then they also use um, oh, mass surveys, drought information to predict. Based off of Costello stuff, they showed how in times of drought there's lower um, reproduction, lower survival. And so they track through their, their model, they track the trend in the population until the next study. So they try to account for that. They try to account for that variability, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So